So next speaker today is Vincent Garcia, who's going to tell us uh, about emerging new approaches uh, to image um, nanoscale properties of multiferroic materials. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Petro, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to come to this workshop every year. So I will talk about uh, the antiferromagnetic uh, spin textures in bismuth ferrite and how we can play with them using strain, electric field, and uh, the peculiar features that we see also at the ferroelectric domain walls. So this work. This work is a result of a collaboration between many different people, mainly the, our group in CNRS Thales near Paris and the group of Vincent Jacques at the University of Montpellier for the NV magnetometry experiments. So we have two PhD students, Johanna Fischer in our group and Angela Eichel working on this topic. And also we have a strong collaboration with the group of Michel Viret at CEA uh, that uh, were involved in the uh, X-ray resonance scattering experiment. Oops, sorry. So the context of this work is uh, antiferromagnetic spintronics. Um, so these materials have been used uh, in the past in spintronic devices as passive elements. So they, are, they were mainly used to, uh, to uh, pin the magnetization of an adjacent ferromagnetic layer. Uh, through the exchange bias, but uh, recently people are, are in the community are getting very excited about these materials because they, are, they have uh, also intrinsically uh, different uh, uh, interesting properties such as, uh, oh, sorry, and so they are very, uh, they are insensitive to a spurious magnetic field. Um, they have a high uh, uh, resonant frequency uh, in the terahertz uh, range as opposed to the gigahertz or tens of gigahertz for the ferromagnets. Uh, there, there's no uh, uh, very small stray field, so we can have high density uh, antiferromagnetic memories. And also very recently, uh, there were some reports of uh, spin transport on uh, antiferromagnetic insulators over very, very long distances. So. Um, there are still uh, remaining uh, challenges to do antiferromagnetic spintronics. Uh, we need to be able to uh, read uh, electrically the uh, antiferromagnetic order. Um, this is possible in some cases, uh, for example, here on iridium manganese uh, through a tunnel anisotropic magnetoresistance. But also it's possible on uh, antiferromagnetic insulators um, by doing uh, what we call uh, SMR, so spinal magnetoresistance with uh, an adjacent uh, uh, metal with high spin orbit coupling. Uh, we need also to be able to switch uh, the antiferromagnetic order and uh, as it's uh, insensitive to a magnetic field, we need to find other ways. Uh, there was uh, quite a lot of work on copper manganese arsenide uh, uh, because this material is uh, quite peculiar. It's uh, non centrosymmetric and when you're, doing, uh, you're applying current, you're uh, doing a spin uh, transfer torque on this material, it uh, can switch uh, the uh, nail uh, vector. So here in this device here, there are uh, two different lines and sorry, two different lines that are like this. And the nail vector can be switched from uh, vertical to horizontal. And this leads to a change of the resistance here. But uh, this is uh, not so simple because uh, pe these people realized that um, um, when they were trying to look at the antiferromagnetic domains in these films, it's actually very complicated. And uh, when they are applying current, uh, they are switching only a minor fraction of the domains. So uh, we would need to, to have a way to control uh, deterministically uh, the antiferromagnetic domains with uh, electrical input. Uh, so 
to, to be able to control these domains, we need to, to, uh, to be able to see the domains. And this is very challenging because we cannot use uh, conventional techniques uh, such as uh, magnetic force microscopy. But uh, recently, uh, there, was, uh, there were a few results on uh, NV magnetometry uh, experiments where uh, we could see uh, some antiferromagnetic domains. So this is an example from uh, the group of Patrick Malitinsky in uh, Basel, where they could see uh, the, the domains coming out from uh, the, uh, this uh, material. So uh, we uh, work with uh, Bismuth Wright because uh, we believe uh, there, there could be a way to uh, control uh, the antiferromagnetic domains in this uh, multiferric material. So it's, uh, you, you know this material, so uh, it's uh, ferroelectric, but it's also antiferromagnetic with a high uh, nail uh, ordering temperature. But in addition to that, there's a, a non-symmetric uh, magnetoelectric interaction that leads to the spin cycloid in the bulk. So for each uh, polarization vector here, we have three possible uh, k vector of the spin cycloid in the 111 plane. In addition to that, uh, there's also uh, a third uh, interaction that leads to a spin density wave. So this is a, a dyarosinski moria interaction uh, that is related to the tilts of the uh, oxygen octahedra along the polarization. So in that case, there's a, a non-compensated moment that is uh, following the spin cycloid. So this spin cycloid has been uh, characterized mainly by uh, macroscopic techniques uh, such as neutron scattering or Mosborough spectroscopy. And uh, we uh, recently looked at uh, single crystals of bismuth ferrite uh, provided by uh, Michel Viret. Uh, so the, in order to see if we could uh, have some information on the local uh, magnetic textures in these uh, crystals. So there are big domains with uh, 71 degree domain walls here. And uh, this is the uh, signal uh, we collected by NV magnetometry. And you see uh, a clear uh, modulation of the stray field here that is indicating that we have a spin cycloid on the surface of this uh, crystal. And uh, when we, uh, we look at the geometry, we uh, understand that this cycloid here propagates uh, not on the surface, but is uh, slightly tilted, and uh, the period corresponds to what we would expect. Uh, in the films, uh, it's, it's a bit more complicated. And um, in our group, uh, Daniel Sando uh, worked on the influence of the strain uh, by epitaxy on the magnetic order of these films. And uh, you see here that in blue, for high uh, tensile or compressive strain, the spin cycloid uh, no longer exists. And there's a, a pseudo-collinear pseudo uh, antiferromagnetic order. But for small strain, uh, we can still preserve the spin cycloid uh, as in the bulk. And uh, here in this small window, um, there could be another uh, exotic cycloid that doesn't exist in the bulk. So these films were, were uh, initially grown by uh, a YAG laser. And uh, they, they showed uh, very disordered ferroelectric domains, uh, mosaic domains. And we, recently with Daniel Sando, uh, we, we looked at uh, uh, the influence of the growth on uh, the structure of these films. And now we are working as many other groups uh, with uh, an excimer laser. And we can have uh, highly ordered films uh, with striped domain structure. Uh, but what is the difference between these two uh, films? And uh, we looked at it with uh, X-ray diffraction. And we see that on these films, uh, there's a uh, a large mosaicity from the uh, omega scan here, as opposed to these films. And also, there's a large uh, strain gradient that uh, we don't see in the film grown by uh, the excimer laser. And this is confirmed by uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy, where we see that in the films here, 
there's a large uh, strain variation on uh, close to the interface uh, with the substrate that we don't see here on the films. So, uh, so the films we are growing now are slightly different from the others. And uh, this allows us to have also uh, different strains. So in black, you see now the new films that we can grow. And we can have a lot of intermediate states that we didn't reach before. Uh, so uh, let's start with uh, looking at the films on dysprosome scandate. Uh, so the films here have uh, two elastic domains that we detect with uh, X-ray diffraction. So you see the two domains here. And uh, they have a stride domain structure with uh, 71 degree domain walls. Uh, we looked at uh, them uh, by neutron diffraction uh, with a group of uh, Pascal Manuel in Oxford. And uh, you see here the two elastic domains. We looked at the magnetic order uh, on the one half, one half, one half peak. Uh, for one domain here, you see a single peak, but the other one, there's a splitting that is uh, an indication of uh, the spin cycloid in these films. When we uh, rotate the scattering plane, here we see the splitting coming out of the second uh, variant. OK, so now in, in order to have more insights into the local uh, textures, we use NV magnetometry. So this is a color center in diamond. Uh, that when you uh, shine a green laser on it, it uh, fluoresces in the red. And uh, people show that a single uh, defect could uh, show stable photoluminescence at room temperature. And uh, we can now uh, fabricate a diamond with high purity and control the location of these uh, NV centers. So this is a spin triplet uh, with a difference between the uh, zero and plus minus one state of uh, 2.88 gigahertz. And these two states have different uh, photoluminescence properties. So there, there's uh, a dark state for the plus minus one state and a bright state for the other one. So we can do electron spin resonance by uh, looking at the photoluminescence of this uh, NV center. So you see here, we uh, tune the frequency uh, of the microwave, and you have a high photoluminescence, unless uh, you reach the resonance here uh, of this transition. OK? So now, uh, if we apply a magnetic field near uh, the, this uh, NV center, there will be a Zeeman splitting of the plus minus one state. And we can c uh, characterize it uh, in the same way by doing electron spin resonance. And uh, this is a way to uh, probe uh, the, uh, the magnetic field uh, locally. So after the technical uh, dif difficulty is uh, to, to put this NV center at the end of an AFM tip and uh, scan the surface of the magnetic uh, structure we want to look at. And uh, we have a, a confocal uh, microscope that uh, will uh, collect the photoluminescence of uh, this NV center. And we uh, define a microwave antenna on the sample uh, to be able to do as the electron spin resonance. So the tips are fabricated in a group of Patrick Malitinsky uh, that now uh, built a, a small company called QNAMI. So we looked at the films on dysprosome scandate. We observed a uh, uh, modulation of the stray field here, uh, going from left to right. We have a variation of from positive to negative stray field uh, that is in, an indication of the spin cycloid. In addition to that, we see also uh, uh, some variations here of the propagation vector that is going up, down, up, down. And we can draw boundaries between these uh, domains. And uh, we believe this is a very uh, similar to the shape of the ferroelectric domains that we observed before. Uh, so in order to make sure that uh, this was really the case, we defined single ferroelectric domains uh, by the trailing field of the AFM tip. And uh, with markers, we could go back to these areas and do NV magnetometry. And we observed that for each uh, ferroelectric domain, 
we had a single uh, a spin cycloid with a propagation vector that is uh, 90 degrees from the polarization. So this shows that, uh, in principle, with this kind of uh, multiferric material, we are able to control uh, the antiferromagnetic domains uh, with an electric field. Uh, so the period also uh, is slightly uh, larger than in the bulk because of the compressive strain we apply. Um, so we can also do uh, quantitative measurements. Uh, this was, uh, these were before uh, short measurements, but we can do the full uh, electron spin resonance spectrum at each pixel and have the, uh, the stray field, uh, the value of the stray field pro projected along the NV axis. So with that, <coughs> we are able to estimate <coughs> uh, this uh, uncompensated moment and it's uh, around uh, 0 0.2 about magneton per ion. So this is uh, larger than what has been observed before in the bulk. And uh, this is also a, a value that we observe for the single crystals. So we believe because we are probing mainly uh, the last surface layer, the five, last five nanometers, let's say, uh, the, the gyrosine chemoia interaction is increased at the surface. So as we have a periodic system, now we, we tried also to, uh, to look at the, uh, these uh, films with uh, X-ray uh, resonant elastic scattering. So this is done at uh, Soleil Synchrotron uh, with Nicolas Jaouen and also with our colleagues at CEA. So, uh, so we have uh, the films with uh, stripes and uh, we uh, send uh, the X-ray beam that we, we, we can tune its energy, and we looked at the diffracted pattern. Uh, so when we uh, tune the energy to the oxygen KH, here we can see uh, the uh, two spots corresponding to the ferroelectric stripes. Uh, what uh, we observe is that uh, from these uh, ferroelectric uh, stripes, we observe a circular uh, dichroism, uh, which is uh, quite, uh, quite strange. And this is an indication of an electric uh, chirality in these, uh, in these films. So, um, so we believe this is related to uh, the domain walls uh, in, the, in our multiferroic films and uh, that we don't have icing walls uh, uh, at uh, the 71 degree domain walls, but uh, something more like a block uh, walls. Uh, so if you imagine that the polarization is rotating at the domain wall, so we, let's say we are going from P4 to P3 here, so we have a rotation of the polarization, but then we are going from P3 to P4, so we would have also a rotation on the other direction. If we have something like this, we, could not, uh, we would not be able to see uh, uh, some decreasing because the net chirality is zero, okay? So uh, what we think is that uh, we don't have this kind of pattern, but something more uh, uh, strange because we would have uh, every second domain wall a large variation of the rotation, okay, to, in order to be able to have always the same uh, sense of rotation. So then we uh, looked at the same uh, film but with the iron L edge. So this time the pattern is very different. We have four main peaks. And these four peaks correspond to the two cycloids. So there's a specular uh, beam here, and uh, in diagonal, there are the two uh, cycloids. These two cycloids uh, show also circular dichroism, and this is normal because the spin cycloid is a uh, carol. Okay? The, the rotation is defined by uh, the sense of uh, the polarization. Okay, but in addition to that, we have additional peaks here in the middle, and these peaks uh, correspond to the ferroelectric stripes. So uh, we think we uh, see uh, some chiral antiferromagnetic object at the uh, stitching of the cycloid uh, at the domain walls. 
And also with NV magnetometry, here we see uh, that the uh, stray field is increased every, uh, every other domain wall. Okay. Uh, the guys in uh, CEA uh, performed atomistic simulation. Uh, they, they fixed uh, the uh, ferroelectric pattern and uh, defined uh, this uh, strange domain wall, uh, every uh, other domain wall. And they uh, simulated the stray field coming from this pattern. And you see that it's quite similar to what we observe uh, experimentally. Um, so now, um, let me go back to the strain tuning of this uh, film. And uh, so in, uh, here in the boxes here, I will show uh, the influence of the strain on the uh, magnetic textures of BFO. So we are going from STO to SSO here. Uh, the, all the films display similar uh, uh, structural properties with two elastic variants here and two there. Okay. They have also uh, similar uh, PFM uh, properties with two uh, uh, ferroelectric variants with 71 degree domain walls. So the, the magnetic textures corresponding to these films uh, is shown here. So this is another film on dysprosum scandate. We have similar uh, properties with a zigzag pattern uh, with 90 degrees between each K vector. We did it also for terbium scandate. The pattern is, is not very different. And uh, so this is corresponding to the uh, K1 along 1 minus 1, 0. Uh, for each polarization vector. And you see that when the polarization in the plane of the film is rotating by 90 degrees, the K vector is rotating by 90 degrees as well. Uh, for the films on gadolinium scandate, we have a slightly different pattern. So there's still a zigzag here, but the, the angle between the K vector is no uh, longer uh, 90 degrees. So we think it's coming from the exotic uh, spin cycloid with uh, 1, 1, minus 2 type vectors. And uh, here, uh, when we have these vectors, uh, uh, we, we can define an angle uh, that is around uh, 120 degrees uh, for these uh, two uh, vectors. Uh, for the films on samarium scandate, uh, we no longer see uh, an ordered uh, structure but uh, we have more uh, patches that we believe are related to the uh, antiferromagnetic domains. Surprisingly, on strontium titanate, we also see uh, uh, spin cycloids. And uh, the angles here are more compatible with what we see on gadolinium and scandate. So the phase diagram might be a bit more complicated than what, we, uh, uh, what Daniel Sando and our colleagues uh, defined before. So we checked also with X-ray uh, resonance elasticity scattering that we had two kinds of cycloids. Because here on the first film on this prism scandate, we have a square pattern defined by the two cycloids that are 90 degrees from each other. But here on gadolinium scandate, we have a rectangular pattern because the angle between the two cycloids is not uh, 90 degrees. Uh, we looked at the influence of the electric field on these patterns. It's okay? Okay, thank you. And so, uh, uh, in the same manner as before, we defined single uh, ferroelectric domains and looked at the influence of these uh, uh, domains on the uh, cycloid. Uh, what is surprising compared to what we saw on this prosium scandate is that when we are uh, looking at films on gadolinium scandate. Uh, so we initially have a cycloid too. But when we write a single domain, we always have a cycloid one, but not the same as before, the cycloid one that is uh, tilted out of plane. So a uh, one, zero, one uh, type of uh, cycloid propagation vector. For the films on samarium scandate, we initially have an, an AFM uh, a pattern, but when we write domains, we see a spin cycloid. So we believe for this two uh, strain, we are at the boundary between uh, two kinds of uh, magnetic orders. 
Uh, we also checked for gadolinium uh, for uh, dysprosium candidate that uh, uh, when we are changing the, the the structure of the films from the stripes to a single domain, we are not changing the strain. So this is uh, something uh, that we don't understand yet. And uh, if you have uh, ideas, uh, this would be uh, very nice. Um, so this is another way to present the data. We uh, uh, are defining a single domain with polarization pointing to the bottom corner here. So for DSO, TSO, no, no difference. For uh, GSO, we have a different cycloid, so the, the one that is uh, 45 degrees from polarization in the plane. And for a uh, summer candidate, we have a, a another k vector uh, with a, a 1, 1, minus 2 uh, propagation direction. So with that, I would like to uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I hope I convinced you of the uh, interest of uh, NV magnetometry with uh, X-ray uh, elastic uh, resonance scattering to, to look at the magnetic textures in antiferro magnets. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk. Questions, please? Um, let's see, it's in the back. Yeah, okay. Uh, so as I understand, the, the NV center, so you can image essentially the, the magnetic field, the local field that's along the axis of this NV center, right? So is this something you can control or it's kind of fixed and then so you, do you know then the direction, I guess, of the NV center? So, so yes, there are, there are ways to, uh, to know the direction and uh, this, uh, Basically, this NV center is always on one of the 111 uh, direction. Uh, so uh, there are like uh, a few possibilities. And uh, uh, the, the people, the, the, what they do is uh, they check on the magnetic uh, strip, strip line, uh, the direction of the NV center. Okay, so the, the thing that you image then is uh, always a projection along this yeah, direction. Yeah, exactly. But we are mainly sensitive to the out of plane uh, component of the st stray field. But uh, what people did uh, in uh, ferromagnetic uh, films, they were able to, uh, to look at the same domain wall, for example, with different NV centers and to, to uh, reconstruct the full map. Okay, well, uh, first of all, a beautiful talk. Um, Thank you very much. I have uh, two quick questions and one, one comment. Uh, the first one is, how did you get all the same fumes with these two domain structures? What did you do to the substrate, give you the two domain structure? And secondly, you always look at the texture from the top of the surface. What happened to the cross-section? Did you see anything? Finally, I uh, have a quick comment. We actually uh, were able to also simulate using uh, phase view simulations, look at the cycloid uh, textures, and also demonstrate the electrical control of how this texture actually uh, uh, flipping. Uh, so I would love to talk to you after, after your talk. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. So I've seen your, your, some of your results on archive, and I, uh, I was very interested also. Uh, so for the first uh, question, um, so we have two variants, uh, I believe because we are mainly using these candidates with uh, 110 orientation. So uh, by symmetry, uh, we are favoring uh, these uh, two um, monoclinic domains. Uh, because this 110 orientation of the orthorhombic uh, structure gives uh, a kind of monoclinic uh, cell. Uh, for STO, it's more, much more complicated. And uh, we can define these uh, stripes artificially as well. But sometimes we do have them, but we don't control them very well. For the NV magnetometry on the cross section, sorry. Yes, we tried this, uh, like uh, the the experiments of Chang but uh, uh, we don't control it very well. Uh, for the experiments on the cross section, this would be uh, really uh, amazing, but. Uh, uh, so far, we don't have the resolution with the NV magnetometry to look at uh, 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 this kind of, uh, of textures across the thickness of the film. 
Uh, but we can discuss for the last comment. Yeah. Uh, well, brilliant data, and thanks very much for the talk. Thank Wonderful. Um, I have a slight nagging thought. Uh, when I mean, you're also uh, surface sensitive, more or less. The different methods penetrate to different degrees. Can you estimate that in particular with your, your diamond needle? You're probably very much the top layer, but then in the X-raying, you're a bit further down, and so forth. I mean, so there's a depth profile for each of, of these techniques. Can that influence the result? Yes, it, uh, it can. Uh, so, for example, on the, on the single crystal, we are not exactly at the same uh, uh, period as what we have in, the, in bulk, uh, in macroscopic measurements. And also, the, there, were, there were small um, variations also on the, on the period for the films on this rosium scandate. So it's qualitatively uh, similar, uh, but <coughs> I can't say uh, for sure that uh, uh, there, there's a difference because the, we have to take into account the errors of the measurements and so. so. But uh, I would say that uh, even uh, even between the, these domains, when they are bigger or smaller, we see differences. Uh, on, the, on the films where we have a stable uh, cycloid one, on dysprosome scandate, terbium scandate, we systematically see a, a, a different period from the striped domain structure to the single domains. On the single domains, we are getting very close to the bulk value, 65. But for the, the, the pattern, we are increasing the period. So I think there's somewhat uh, 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 a lock-in a lock of the period to the uh, uh, ferroelectric stripes, but uh, I, I don't have a clear vision of that. Okay, wonderful. Let's thank Vincent one more time. <laughs>